In today's video, we're going to be tackling what is probably one of my favorite beers of the year, and it is pretty much an annual thing with most folks, and that is brewing an Oktoberfest style beer, a Märzen. Now, if you are looking for a Fest beer, which is a similar but different style of beer also associated with Oktoberfest, Fest beer is what they actually drink at Oktoberfest in Germany, um, then just stay tuned on the channel because there will be a Fest beer coming out very shortly after this video. However, in this particular video, we're covering Märzen, which is the original style of Oktoberfest beer that changed a long, long time ago, but Märzen is the familiar amber-colored lager that is very rich and malty, uh, and is many people's favorite beer of the year. It's typically what Oktoberfest beer is in the United States. These are delicious, rich lagers that are slightly stronger than your typical lager. Usually they come in between 5.8 and 6.2%. They're full of wonderful, bready, toasty notes, kind of like a Vienna lager on steroids. I like mine with a little touch of caramel over the top of it. It's not necessarily uh, a necessity though. Many people do prefer a toastier, breadier Oktoberfest style Märzen. Traditionally, one would make a Märzen in March. Märzen in German really refers to brewing a beer in March. I'm starting mine a little bit later, it's still the summer, so uh, we're, we're not going to be doing a true long lager for this one, but I am going to be doing a bit of a split batch experiment, and this is something that I really wanted to do for a long time. So I've geared up and I've made a 10 gallon recipe this time. We are going to split that between two five gallon batches. The same wort, two different yeasts, just like I did with the Hefeweizen not too long ago. We're going to be taking a classic lager yeast and a classic fermentation schedule. So this is going to be Diamond Lager from Lalamant, and we're going to be putting it head to head with Lutra Kvike, which is a great yeast. It's a fantastic, clean fermenting Kvike yeast that does a very, very good job of emulating a lager profile. I used it most recently in a German style Pilsner that turned out excellent. And I do believe it can go head to head with any lager yeast, but there's no real way to tell unless you have the two side by side off of the same wort. So I think this is gonna be a pretty cool experiment and I hope you guys are interested to see the results. Many people, myself included, do swear by Lutra's ability to go unnoticed if you didn't tell somebody that it was a Kvike yeast and told them it was a lager instead, I'm sure they could do it. Pseudo lagers are getting very good these days. <laughs> Really quickly before we jump into our recipe, I just want to say thank you to a couple organizations for helping support me and make this video possible. The first is Northern Brewer. They provided the ingredients for the batch. And if you want to make this batch of beer yourself, you can find everything you need, including both yeasts, on their website, along with some fantastic equipment and knowledge as well if you want to learn more about home brewing. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply. They make the system that I have been using for the last year and a half. I own both a 20 gallon and a 10 gallon version of their system as well as both 120 volt and 240 volt power options. So they have plenty of options for your electric brew house. Great people, great YouTube channel. I'm sure you know about that. So check them out as well. Once again, this recipe is for 10 gallons. So if you are brewing this beer on a five gallon system, it is entirely possible to make a five gallon batch of it. Just cut the recipe in half exactly. So now for the recipe, we're going to be starting out with 12 pounds of Weyermann Bark Pilsner Malt. Uh, that is going to be our base malt. We're going to add to that about 8 pounds of Weyermann Dark Munich Malt. Uh, I like Dark Munich Malt a little bit more so than the Light Munich for this particular style. I think it gives a little bit more richness to the overall feeling. We're going to cut that though a little bit with 2 pounds of Vienna just for some added malt complexity. That keeps it from being a little too heavy. You still get the richness and the dark color from the Dark Munich. We're going to add a little bit of Caramunic 3, that's a pound and three quarters. That's going to add a little bit of extra sweetness to the whole thing and keep it from getting too dry, but also giving it a nice rich color. That will add a very small amount of caramel character to the beer as well. Lastly, we're adding a pound and a half of Melanoidin malt. This is going to add some rich maltiness and some depth to the beer. It's also going to help since we're not doing a decoction mash for this beer. It's that's one way to get some of that nice, rich maltiness in a beer like this, especially this style of beer. However, I don't have time for that right now, and we're not going to be doing that. So adding a little bit of melanoid and malt is going to help simulate that, and it does a very good job. For our hops, we're going to be using only one type of hop, and we're only going to be doing one addition. Very simple from the perspective of hops. So we're adding in four ounces of Hallertau Mittelfrühe at 60 minutes to bitter. That's it. So if you're brewing a five gallon batch, just two ounces at 60 minutes. For our water profile, I'm actually going to opt to not add too many minerals to this water. We're going to start with spring water, which has some residual minerals in it, but it's pretty close to zero. And we're going to add just four grams of calcium chloride to the whole thing. That adds a little bit extra calcium, a little bit extra chloride. 
I'll put some numbers on the screen as far as water profile, but I'm really not too concerned because it's all gonna be very, very light. For our use, we're doing a split batch. Like I said, one five gallon batch is getting a packet of Lutrica Vike, and the other five gallon batch is gonna be getting a packet of Lalaman Diamond Lager. The mash on this beer, as I said, I'm not doing a decoction mash because I just don't have time for that. So what we're gonna be doing is just doing one single rest, 60 minutes at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. That should get us a good level of fermentability in the wort, but not making it too dry because we don't want this one to be too dry because then it'll be kind of bitter, especially with all the caramel malt uh, additions and the darker Munich character. So I want to have a little bit of balance there at the very end, a little bit of sweetness to keep everything in line. All right, that's about going to do it for now. So let's go ahead and get mashed in. I added 16 gallons of spring water to my 20 gallon claw hammer supply 240 volt system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature, milling my grain while this happened. I also measured out four grams of calcium chloride and added that to the heating up strike water. Once it had reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in, started to recirculate the mash and left it at the single rest temperature. Ten minutes into the mash though, I took a pH reading. I saw a measurement of 5.42, which was actually right on target, so no lactic acid adjustments needed. Once the mash had rested at 150 Fahrenheit for a total of about 60 minutes, I raised it up to 170 for 15 minutes for the mash out rest. This just really helps the watering process go a bit faster. So I let it sit at 170 for 15 minutes and then I pulled out the grain basket and let it drain. At this time, I also set the controller to maintain a temperature that was just below boiling so I didn't have a boil over while I was waiting for my grain basket to finish draining. Now, this took about 15 minutes to finish draining and once I was happy with it, I removed the basket and I set the controller to about 80% power, which is sufficient to maintain a good rolling boil on the 240 volt 20 gallon system. At this time, I added my 60 minute addition, which was my only hop addition, four ounces of Hallettown Middle for a... I let the boil continue for 50 minutes and then with 10 minutes remaining, I added a Whirlflock tablet and I also added some yeast nutrient to help support the kvike and the lager yeasts. 10 minutes later, I ended the boil and then I started to chill it down as fast as I could. And I had two different pitching temperatures for this split batch. I took an OG sample using the Easy Dance and I saw an original gravity of 1058, which was two points short of the intended goal of 1060, but not anything to really worry about. Once the wort temperature had reached about 85 degrees, I transferred half of it into my Spike CF5. At that point, I pitched in my one packet of Lutrica Vike, and I also added one vial of White Labs Clarity Firm. continue to chill the other half of the batch down as far as I could get it, which was about 70 degrees this time of year. And then I transferred it into the fermenter and let it sit in my fermentation chamber until it had finally reached about 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which was about six hours later. At this point, I also added another vial of White Labs Clarity Firm to this batch and my one packet of Lalaman Diamond Lager. At this point, I left both batches to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, it's going to be split up a little bit because it's two very, very different types of fermentations. The last split batch that I did with two different yeasts, I was using pretty much the same fermentation schedule because it was the same kind of yeast, just two different manufacturers. In this case, it's two very different kinds of yeasts for the same end result. So I'm going to flip my typical spiel on its head and I'm going to tell you what I'm actually doing first and then I'll give you guys kind of some alternate options. So first of all, for our Lutrica Vike batch, the first thing we're going to be doing is actually pitching this one nice and hot somewhere around 85 degrees. 
and we're gonna ferment it even hotter around 95 degrees. This has produced the best results for me with Lutra. It's a very fast fermentation, which is typically finished in about three days. That will give me enough time to clear up some fermenter space for when I brew my Fest beer not too long from now. The diamond lager yeast, on the other hand, is going to take a little bit longer because we're doing this in a classic lager fermentation. The Fest beer is going to experiment around with pressure fermentation versus non-pressurized lager fermentation, but in this case, we're just comparing non-pressurized lager fermentation with a Kvik fermentation. I think we can kind of draw all the conclusions we need to from these two videos, but in this case, it is a classic lager fermentation. This means that I'm gonna be pitching my diamond lager yeast much, much later than my Lutra Kvik because I need to get the beer down to about 55 degrees in order to actually start fermentation and not pitch at too hot of a temperature, which can cause some issues with the yeast. Typically with a lager fermentation, you're gonna to want to pitch a lot more yeast than your ale fermentations. Uh, one packet of dry yeast, however, is a sufficient amount of cells, particularly for this style of beer. We're gonna pitch one packet in and we're gonna pitch it at 55 degrees and we're gonna ferment it at about 53 to 55 degrees in my fermentation chamber, my, my chest freezer, uh, for probably about a week and a half to two weeks. That should be enough time to get us down to about 70% attenuation. At that point, I can take the fermenter out of my fermentation chamber and bring it up to the low 70s to give us what's known as a diacetyl rest. This is a traditional step with a lager fermentation. You diacetyl rest for two or three more days because the yeast does produce diacetyl in its fermentation. It will give it some time at a warmer temperature to clean that up and get your lager tasting more like a traditional lager and not more like a buttery beer. We don't want that. This is a quick lager fermentation, so I'm not gonna be letting this beer sit around at lager temperatures, 30 to 35 degrees Fahrenheit, for six to nine months, like you would with the traditional Mertzen. No, I'm just gonna add some finings to the whole thing. Fining process is whirl flock in the boil, followed by clarity firm as I pitch my yeast, followed by gelatin finings or biofine, depending on what you wanna use, as you keg the beer. These three things in combination will pretty much without fail drop your beer clear and clean within about 36 to 48 hours. The key point here is to make sure your beer is cold during that entire time at about 35 degrees. That'll help drop everything out of solution a lot faster. And if you wanna speed up the process even more, go ahead and add a floating dip tube into your keg and that way you could draw that clearest beer off the very top of the keg as soon as it starts to drop down. I'll be doing this for both my Kvike beer and for my Diamond Lager beer. So hopefully both of them are brilliantly clear within a few uh, days after kegging. Now there are alternatives to this fermentation and I wanna go over those. If you don't wanna use Kvike but you wanna still ferment warmer, you can use a relatively clean ale strain, something like US05 if you ferment it at about 65 degrees. You can also use some alternative lager yeasts that can handle those higher temperatures, like the Cal Common strain, or like Saf Lager W3470. I've made plenty of great lagers with W3470 fermented at high temperatures. Uh, about 68 degrees is as high as I would comfortably take that, but it will be done very quickly and it will still be just as clean as if you'd fermented it about 50 degrees. If you wanna stick with lager yeasts, in most cases for this particular style of beer, it is a Bavarian lager, and I would highly recommend sticking with Bavarian lager strains. Try to avoid the Bohemian lager strain. That is, in fact, W3470. Bohemian lager yeasts tend to be a little bit higher attenuating yeasts. They tend to leave a little less sugar behind, and they can sometimes carry through a little bit more sulfur, in my experience, depending on the manufacturer. Bavarian lagers leave behind a little bit more sugar. They leave behind a little bit more sweetness and therefore malt complexity. So something like a Bach, something like an Oktoberfest Meritzet, a Helles beer, and also our Fest beer, uh, these are gonna be better suited for Bavarian lager strains. It's not totally clear whether Diamond Lager is a Bohemian or Bavarian style lager yeast. Um, it might be neither. Uh, it should be interesting to see how much is left behind, but if you want a true authentic Bavarian lager yeast, recommending Y Yeast 2206. Of course, if you also just want to do something different and want to experiment around with a pretty cool technique in lager fermentations, you can also pressure ferment these beers. Pressure fermentation can be done with any lager yeast. Uh, it can be done with an ale yeast as well. Basically, the whole point of it is external pressure that is applied. It'll prevent your yeast from uh, producing off flavors that would normally be associated with a high pitch temperature, like fusel alcohols. It also prevents acetaldehyde and diacetyl formation in the beer as well. So it's a pretty handy technique. This helps you get your fermentation nice and hot and therefore ferment much faster uh, when you apply these techniques. We'll be comparing the results of pressure versus non-pressurized fermentation when we do our Fest beer very soon.
Both beers actually reach the same final gravity of 10-11, uh, but at very different time frames. The Lutra Kvike beer actually ended up finishing out in about three or four days, so I was able to package that one first. The Diamond Lager, on the other hand, really did take its sweet time finishing up fermentation. It took about 10 days to hit the final gravity and finish primary fermentation, so at that point I took it out of the fermentation chamber and uh, just let it sit at ambient room temperature, which for me in the basement is about 68 degrees. I let it sit at 68 degrees for about three days for a diacetyl rest before actually packaging it. I added cold side findings to both beers, and I conditioned them in my keezer at 32 degrees for two weeks before serving. The beer is called the Captain's Ration because I just recently promoted to Captain in the Army National Guard, and it comes in at 6.3% ABV and 23 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, they're both crystal clear amber beers. They are absolutely gorgeous. Um, I'm really getting a nice tone off of this, a nice copper tone um, from the color of this beer. They pour with a sort of cream colored head. It's actually really good, long lasting head. Uh, sticks around for a long time, leaves a good layer on the surface and leaves good lacing. So all in all, checks all marks with appearance. Ah, the things I do for YouTube. All right, so. <laughs> In the proper attire, in public, where everyone can see me, I am now gonna be tasting these two beers. We have on the left, in the Hofbrau glass, the Lutra Kvike beer, and in the right, in the Spaten glass, we have our Diamond Lager beer. So the question is, what are the differences between the two beers, and are they comparable? So starting off with aroma, the Diamond Lager side. The aroma on this beer is very toasty very caramely, uh, very deep and rich. Um, I get a lot of that strong German malt. It has kind of a deep base to it, uh, a really nice richness, actually. Yeah, it's a very pleasant aroma. Moving on to the Lutra side. Much of the same thing, but there's a slight difference to it. This one smells slightly sweeter, actually. It's really interesting. Um, it's got a little bit more of a caramel character to it, as opposed to the um, kind of toastier character of this one in terms of the aroma. But it's very similar overall. All right, so then moving in for mouthfeel, it should be interesting to see if there's any difference because they both finished at the same exact final gravity, um, but sometimes there is a subtle difference in mouthfeel that's a attributed to yeast in general, so we'll see if that is the case here. <sighs> now feeling a diamond lager. Um, solidly medium body. I'd say this is like a light medium bodied mouthfeel. Uh, there's a little bit of roundness to it, a little bit of smoothness to it. It has some crisp character, but not to a great degree. There's really nothing too much to write home about. It's, it's rather soft. Um, Kind of wish there was a little bit more edge to it, I guess. So then moving in towards the Lutra. It's actually quite different. Oh, the Lutra's much lighter. That's weird. No, the Lutra feels much, much lighter. That's interesting. This feels a lot more like a traditional Pilsner than anything else, um, in terms of mouthfeel alone, of course. That's not surprising given that I just used the, the plain old spring water for this batch and, and didn't add anything to it. That's fascinating though that there's a slight difference between the two. There, this is fuller, this is not as full. Um, this feels a little bit edgier, this one doesn't. 
that's different. Cool. All right. But now the part that you all have been waiting for is, what is the difference between the two of these in flavor? Can Lucha really stack up to a true lager in terms of the flavor experience for a Merits in Oktoberfest? Let's find out. It's a good one. Now this beer is almost exactly what I wanted out of a Merits in Oktoberfest. It is a little dry. Um, and we'll talk more about that later when I talk about ways to improve the batch, but what I'm getting out of this is a dark breadiness, a full breadiness. Um, there's a little bit of toastiness in there, uh, a little bit of a caramel hint, which is something that I wanted. I want that little bit of caramel in there in my Oktoberfests. I do like that. I think I said that in the beginning of the video, but that is something I prefer. Um, there's a nice, deep richness to this beer that is just very hard to describe, but something that I really do enjoy, and it makes it feel authentic, it makes it feel true to style. The dominant flavor characteristic is toastiness and nuttiness. Um, there's, a, there's a hazelnut slash chestnut kind of note to this um, that really is quite pleasant. It, it comes through very, very nicely, and it goes very well with the breadiness, with the caramel note. I'm a big fan. I really am. Uh, the yeast character is very clean. For the hop character, there's a little bit of bitterness to balance out the sweetness. No hop flavor or anything, but a good balance. I mean, this is 6.3% uh, beer and I could drink liter after liter of this thing, no problem. It is super drinkable, super delicious. All right, so then moving on to the, uh, the Lutra. How does this stack up? Okay, so it is different. Yeah, it's it's a good beer in its own right. If this was standalone and not next to a true lager, I think you could actually give this to somebody and say that this was a lager yeast and they'd probably believe you, but it is slightly different. There is a small amount of citrus character to this beer that is not in this beer. The Lutra is slightly more tart. And there's a specific reason for that. Uh, the pH of the beer is to blame. So I took a pH reading of these two beers as they are right now. Um, and I think you'll see a distinct difference between the two of them. The Lutra finished at 4.03 uh, pH and the Diamond Lager finished at 4.2. So that's a big difference actually because pH is a logarithmic scale. So 0.2 is actually a lot. While the difference is slight, this one is definitely noticeably more tart. Um, that's the biggest differentiator, but secondly, there's also not as much complexity in the flavor. It has some nice caramel undertones. It has good breadiness. It's missing the nuttiness, but it's still toasty. There's also a little bit of a sulfur edge on this one. Uh, there's a tiny bit of diacetyl in this one as well, which is typical with a lager, but this one is different. It's not bad. The two of them side by side show some differences, but I can't necessarily say that this is a worse beer than this one. So don't misconstrue this at all. Now I've always said that Lutra can make a perfectly suitable substitute for a lager yeast, and I still stand behind that. I've also always said that when the two are side by side, they're not exactly gonna be one to one. This is something I have said before in my Pilsner video. This is a good pseudo lager it's not the exact copy of a lager yeast, but that doesn't mean you can't replicate the style in a good way with Lutra yeast. Now, of course, you could go through and pressure ferment a lager yeast to get a faster Oktoberfest. You could also go through and use a clean fermenting ale yeast. You could go through and use a, uh, a high fermentation lager yeast like W3470 and get good results. But not everybody in the world has the ability to pressure ferment. Not everybody in the world has the ability to control their temperature down to 68 Fahrenheit or something like that. There's people who live in parts of the world like, I don't know, Australia, where it gets super hot. And sometimes all you have is a yeast that can ferment in the 90s Fahrenheit. And that's where Lutra comes in to create these clean pseudo lagers that are very good. So the point of this video is to show you that even though I'm nitpicking, these are really two very similar beers. The two different yeasts they are going to create two slightly different beers, and the differences are just that. They're slight. They're not that bad. This Lutra beer is 90% of this Diamond Lager. 
So at the end of the day, let's wrap it up. The Diamond Lager Yeast and the Lutra Kvike. The only difference between the two of these is this is slightly more citrusy, slightly more maybe lemony than this. And this is slightly more nutty, slightly more toasty, slightly more complex flavor. Uh, do primarily just to mash pH. I think if I had increased my mash pH to 5.5 or 5.6, I would probably be favoring the Lutra beer over the Diamond Lager, just simply because of that pH drop. Both of these are very good Oktoberfest beers. I'm very happy to have them on tap. And so, while I combine them, we're gonna talk about what I could do to make this particular recipe better. The main thing for me is that this beer definitely attenuated a bit farther than I think it should have. It finished at 10.11 for both batches, but particularly so for the Lutra batch, it feels more like an amber ale than an Oktoberfest beer. The lager has a different mouthfeel and therefore kind of doesn't feel as much like a amber ale, perhaps. But the point is this should really finish at like 10.14, 10.15 perhaps, um, and then it'll be far more authentic feeling. So my thoughts on this one are to modify the mash schedule. Now I used a single temperature method. There's nothing wrong with that. Michael James, I'm waiting for your comment because you do always seem to have something to say, don't you? But for this particular beer, maybe we should use a step mash, specifically the Hochkurtz method of mashing. This is something I used for my Fest beer, um, and it's a great way to kind of control the fermentability of the beer. The Hochkurtz method is essentially a traditional German step mash schedule that says, all right, you're gonna ferment about 145 to 148 for about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how fermentable you want the wort to be, and then raise it up to 160 or so for another 30 to 45 minutes. How you play with those two temperature zones is how you control the fermentability and the mouthfeel of your beer at the end of the process. So if I wanted this beer to finish slightly higher, I would probably incorporate a shorter rest at that first low temperature step and uh, a longer rest on the second temperature step. That's exactly what I did for my Fest beer, uh, which will be coming out, like I said, soon. So it should be interesting to see if that worked the way I think it does. But that's what I would recommend doing uh, for this particular beer in order to bring out that extra bit of sweetness. This is an absolutely awesome Oktoberfest and I'm very happy to crush it by the leader. It is of course that time of year where we can do that sort of thing shame free. So that's it. At the end of this video, I'm left with the conclusion that you really can't replace a true lager yeast with something else. And I think we all knew that coming into this video. But Lutrikafike is a damn close substitute and there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't use it if you have only that option. A lot of people, a lot of purists and snobs out there really do like to shame people for brewing a lager or a pseudo lager with different ingredients or different techniques. And honestly, that really sucks. And I kind of hate that about the home brewing culture. Stop being that person if you're that person. This is a hobby. It's all it is. Stop being a know-it-all. Stop being a jerk. Just have fun with beer. Brew it the way you want to brew it and enjoy it the way you want to enjoy it. Stop being a jerk to other people about it. There's a million different ways to brew a beer. Now that we live in 2022 and not 1945, it's honestly a lot easier to get things done. And there's multiple different ways to do things due to uh, scientific advancements. So enjoy. Brew the beer you want to make it the way you want to make it. Take tips if you want to. Don't if you don't want to. At the end of the day, we're all just trying to have a good time. So on that note, happy Oktoberfest. If you enjoyed the video, you want to leave a like and comment, subscribe, all that stuff, please do so. It really means a lot to me. If you want to support the channel, please feel free to pick up a t-shirt, hoodie, something like that in my merchandise store that's in the description box. You can also check out my Patreon, which is another great way to help support me. I also have channel memberships, and if you feel inclined, please hit the super thanks button as a way to say you really appreciate the content. It means a lot to me personally. I also have an Amazon store where you can pick up a bunch of gear that I recommend. And if you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook now as The Apartment Brewer, so check that out for some more frequent content updates. Anyway guys, if you're still here, I really do appreciate you being here and watching until the end. It means a lot to me, and thank you very, very much. So until the next one, Prost! And that's a leader of beer, yeah.